Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you could find your seats, please. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. My name is Matt Abbott, and I am the Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. On behalf of the Council, I would like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening with Dr. C. Raja Mohan, our inaugural Marshall M. Bhutan Asia Fellow. I would like to say a special thank you to all the members of our Board of Directors who are in attendance tonight who contributed to the establishment of this fellowship. A few notes on housekeeping. For your information, this program is on the record, and please also silence your cell phones. As you may know, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs hosts over 200 events per year, and we have several coming up in which you may be interested. On Monday, May 16th, Arthur Krober, the Managing Director of Gavkal Dragonomics, will discuss the Chinese economy. On Tuesday, May 17th, Zalmay Khalilzad, the former U.S. Ambassador to Iraq, Afghanistan, and the United Nations, will speak about his new book. And from June 1st to June 3rd, leaders from around the world will convene in Chicago for our Chicago Forum on Global Cities. Dr. Marshall Bhutan will introduce Dr. Mohan, and I would like to extend a very warm welcome to, for Dr. Bhutan back to Chicago. Dr. Bhutan is Senior Fellow for India with the Asia Society Policy Institute. He is also President Emeritus of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, having served as President from 2001 to 2013. I will then moderate the question and answer session after Dr. Mohan's remarks. Thank you, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Marshall Bhutan. Thank you, Ark. I appreciate that. I, I'm so glad you cut that bio off at two sentences. Uh, um, I am simply delighted to be, to be back in Chicago tonight, um, and I want to thank all of you for, for being here. So many familiar faces, faces of friends and colleagues uh, in, my, in our years in Chicago. And Barbara and I miss this city a lot, and we miss especially our friends here. Um, and we, it's wonderful for me to, to come here, as I do you know, every four or six months or so, and been privileged to do and see the city so vibrant, um, with the exception of the traffic to and from O'Hare, <laughs> which is a, a nightmare. Um, I experienced uh, three times this week since I made a quick, quick trip back to the East Coast uh, after I got here. Um, and of course, it's a very special pleasure for me, um, deep, deeply gratifying for me to be reconnect with the Council on the occasion of this, uh, the, the inaugural uh, Bhutan Asia Fellow. Um, I'm, I am so grateful to the Council's board uh, for proposing this, uh, for, to Lester for putting it in front of the board, um, and to many in this audience, as well as others on the board, um, including people like Richard Cooper, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, for their very generous uh, backing. Uh, of this fellowship. My thanks go also to Ivo Dalder um, for supporting this himself and uh, helping to get it off to a start this year. Um, the, uh, I think the Chicago Council is in very good hands with Ivo. I've been very impressed with what he's been doing. I said to a couple of people in the last few days that that Evo is doing all the things I would have wanted to do if I'd stayed longer, but I'm glad that Evo is doing them rather than, rather than I. Um, and I think the council with Evo at the helm can be very confident of its future as it looks forward to its 100th anniversary in just six years. Is that right? Yes, yeah, six years. Um, the, uh, as many in this room know, uh, when I came here, and I, as I, through the years, I tried to sustain uh, an effort to strengthen ties between uh, Chicago and Asia in particular, um, because of my own interests, because of why I, how I see Asia and its importance to the world and to great cities in the world, um, of which Chicago is most certainly one. Many of you also know of my lifelong, some would say, passionate interest in India. 
So it's especially gratifying to me that the first Bhutan Asia Fellow uh, is a very distinguished Indian, uh, Dr. C. Raja Mohan. Uh, Raja is the f today the founding director of Carnegie India, a new institution in India uh, established under the auspices of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, which all, all of you know is based in Washington. Um, now you've all seen Raja's uh, uh, stellar biography. I'm not going to recap that for you tonight. Suffice it to say that as a journalist, as an academic, as an advisor to the Indian government, Raja has played a key role now over, certainly over 20 years, in shaping and reshaping his current country's foreign policies um, and its thinking more broadly about India's place in the world. Um, as you also know, uh, in its first four decades, um, India's economic policies, its autarkic economic policies, its so-called non-alignment foreign policy uh, limited the reach and frankly the, the depth and importance of its key relationships in the world. But with the end of the Cold War, uh, with the advent of globalization uh, and India's own economic reforms in 1991, India had eventually to, to rethink those uh, international policies it had pursued for so long. It took some years uh, for India to come to grips with that new future as it moved into the 21st century. And I can say with confidence to all of you, since I witnessed it firsthand, Raja and I have known each other for somewhere around 30 years. Though he or I probably, I shouldn't admit that, but it's close to that. Um, he was very young, I was not. Um, no, he has uh, influenced that discourse in India uh, and articulated a new way of thinking about India's role in the world uh, that even today uh, continues to, to be the dominant paradigm for uh, Indian foreign policy, still, of course, in a, in a process of evolution. Uh, his 2003 book, uh, you have the recent book, or I think I'll make it available later tonight for signing by Raja, perhaps um, uh, his uh, more recent book on Modi's world, um, but uh, his, one of his first books was called Rossing, Crossing the Rubicon, uh, and it was the manifesto for a new Indian foreign and uh, national security uh, policy. And he continues in his columns and books and speeches uh, to advocate for India's uh, reassessment and continual reassessment of its place in the world and how it is going to cope with, especially now, the rap rapidity of change that's going on in the international system. Uh, the, the different, how shall I say, the unusual circumstances of this year's presidential election in the United States, of course, invites that kind of reassessment for countries like India, major countries in the world. Um, India is uh, looking with uh, great interest, and I would say probably increasing concern about how, how it might cope with a substantial change in American foreign policy if it occurs as a result of this election. So I am so pleased and honored uh, to invite my friend uh, C. Raja Mohan, the first Bhutan Asia Fellow to the platform. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you for that uh, very generous introduction. Uh, if my wife was here, she would have loved it. Uh, if my mother was here, she would have believed it. But So don't uh, <laughs> take it too seriously. So it's really... Uh, a delight to be here uh, this evening uh, with all of you in the great town of Chicago. Uh, it's also a special privilege uh, to be the first Marshall Bhutan Asia Fellow. So I want to uh, really uh, thank Marshall and uh, Evoke as the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs uh, for giving me this honor of being the, the first Marshall Bhutan uh, Fellow. Uh, Marshall, of course, is uh, 
well known to everyone in India, in fact, he knows more about India than most of us in India, uh, has been one of, you know, has sustained his interest in India for almost uh, more than 50 years. And more than that, I think uh, his uh, extraordinary service over the last uh, decades of uh, connecting America to Asia, uh, of explaining America to the Asians and explaining Asia to the Americans, uh, very important service. And I think long before uh, Asia became fashionable, uh, we had Marshall and many of his fellow Asianists uh, trying to bridge uh, that huge gap that exists uh, between uh, the, the, the two great continents. So while the East West Coast might be more familiar, uh, getting the rest of uh, uh, this great country to, to focus on, America, uh, on Asia has always been a challenge. And I think uh, it's a great tribute to uh, uh, Marshall for uh, getting that work done in a very, very uh, impressive way. I think Chicago for us, uh, for many Indians, uh, it's a very special city. Uh, whether we know anything about the city or not, I mean, we know one thing uh, that uh, Swami Vivekananda came here in 1893 to participate in the uh, in the Parliament of Religions in the Chicago Art Institute. I have the, had the privilege of going there the other day. In fact, I saw the number of Indians who were just coming there to take a picture, because I think this is something every everyone learns in school. Uh, that look, uh, Swamiji came here and he gave this uh, great lecture uh, in the in the Chicago Art Institute. Uh, I think the Swamiji was was in a way that was part of India's awakening. I mean, I think uh, it was about uh, seeing India in a new light, both in terms of where its own internal uh, its its spiritual inheritance and how does it relate to the world, the larger world. And I think he was one of the first people to travel across uh, to to explain. Uh, what Hinduism meant to the outside world. And at the same time, uh, making that very important uh, affirmation that, look, uh, there is something uh, India must give to the world. There is also something India must learn from the world. Uh, and that it is that sense of reconnecting India uh, to the world uh, was the kind of message uh, framed in a very uh, spiritual uh, uh, dimension uh, that was of great consequence. And I think uh, uh, that will remain, I think, India's own international uh, orientation, uh, uh, Swami Vivekananda has a very uh, important and uh, central place, and for him, Chicago was uh, was quite central. Uh, I think it is also a, a moment when India is uh, reinventing itself today, uh, reaffirming, uh, re-evaluating its international role, uh, having grown over the last 25 years. Uh, how does India relate to the rest of the world? That's once again, I think uh, it's a very important moment for India and for the Indian political class and for the Indian uh, policy uh, establishment to, uh, to frame that today in, a, in an effective way. Uh, it's also a moment, I think, uh, for the United States, uh, which is at a very a critical juncture in its political evolution. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, Marshall talked about uh, the council uh, being established in 1922 uh, in the interwar period. Uh, that was a moment when actually the council was part of the council's uh, motivation was to uh, fend off the spirit of isolationism that had come to uh, dominate the U.S. Uh, discourse in the interwar period and the need for the U.S., which had by then uh, for almost 30 years, the U.S. was already the number one industrial power in the world, but the, the lag between uh, America's calling in the world and the political uh, arguments within uh, resolving the tension was, was quite important. And I think the Chicago Council played a very, very important role. So it's a special privilege then to, uh, to be here uh, to, uh, to see how our trajectory is today. The U.S. that's re-evaluating its role in the international system and India that must, by definition, uh, given its expanded weight, uh, must uh, expand in the, uh, in the coming, uh, coming decades. And that's why the, the title of the talk, I mean, on retrenchment uh, comes in, uh, the, the, the notion that, look, uh, the U.S. will have to uh, readjust, if not retrench, of course, retrench is a strong word. I mean, many uh, believe it's not going to happen. But if you hear uh, what Mr. Donald Trump is saying, uh, what Mr. Bernie Sanders is saying, uh, quite clearly, uh, it is one of saying that, look, uh, that U.S. needs to reevaluate uh, its role. So uh, whether we call it retrenchment, uh, downsizing, uh, readaptation, what are the term you use? Uh, I believe that the U.S. is going to uh, has come to a moment where uh, it has to uh, recalibrate its position in the world, and I think that's going to happen through two sources. I mean, I think one domestically is there a consensus 
for the kind of role that the U.S. has played in the world in the last 70 years. Uh, quite clearly, the kind of things uh, President John F. Kennedy said, bear any burden, pay any price. Uh, that idea that the U.S. is going to do this, that pay any price, bear any burden, quite clearly uh, has less resonance today, and I think especially after the Iraq and the, and the Afghan wars, that there is a questioning of how much the U.S. should do uh, outside and how much uh, should it work with others. Those are very important questions. I think that those are going to be determined by America's internal political debate. I mean, that's one part. The second part is what happens outside the U.S. That is, what happens in Asia has a bearing on how this internal debate uh, will evolve. So therefore, with the historic shifts that are taking place uh, in the power position of Asia, the question of how uh, a, a, an America that's talking to itself about its role in the world and how the world are going to relate to each other, uh, that's going to be uh, one of the uh, critical, I think, uh, uh, critical, I think, uh, 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 Debates, I think that's that's beginning to unfold, and and I think uh, how that evolves is going to have big bearing for for decades to come in the world. Now, I, my my sense is that uh, uh, in this talk, I mean, what what I would like to do is really to make this uh, argument in terms of uh, where the U.S. is headed and how it's going to affect uh, people in India and and Asia. Let me make this uh, in five parts. What I'll uh, begin with is to briefly review uh, where the, how we see from outside this specific U.S. election and the debate that is taking place. And then I'll follow up with, uh, with some uh, sense of the, uh, the structural changes that are taking place uh, in Asia and how the two will intersect. That will be my third part and look at various scenarios of how this intersection between Asia and America could evolve. And then I move on to assess the potential role that India could play uh, in this uh, new uh, circumstance and conclude with uh, the, the prospects for deeper India-US cooperation in shaping the future of Asia. So let me come to the first part, which, which is really about the current debate in the US. Those of us who sit outside, uh, all of us uh, have been fascinated by the debate. I mean, uh, uh, as I said, look, uh, I know this, in, in fact, uh, we are not, we don't have a vote in the US election. Uh, but everybody gets affected by what the U.S. does. So therefore, uh, no taxation without representation or something to that effect that uh, whatever you do will have a bearing uh, on the rest of the world. Therefore, there's great interest, I think, uh, in, in, in the rest of the world uh, in seeing where this election goes. And I think each election cycle, at least in this century, has you know, demonstrated a very interesting things about the U.S. I mean, you go back to 2000 election, I mean, there was this something about counting, I believe, uh, in a state called Florida, uh, and the whole process that you saw, the complexity, the nature of federalism, the kind of devolution of power right down to a county. Uh, I mean, I think it's a great education for those who are outside to see how complex uh, this country is and how, uh, the, how, how the nature of power is, how fragmented it actually is uh, within this country. And in 2008, we saw a man from Chicago, the first African-American to be elected president, I mean, that has raised questions in many parts. Will we in India elect someone from a minority? Because we had a uh, Prime Minister Manmohan Singh was from a small minority. But the fact that, uh, that that doesn't happen too often in most countries, that uh, that the, the US politics could do this, I mean, in, a, in, a, in one of the most important democracies, that you could do this was quite something uh, that I think for most people, I mean, I think it is a question someone I mean, of course, there's a controversy over his birth, but I believe we don't have to go into that. But the, but the fact is, someone in a first generation can actually become the president of the United States. I mean, said something about the, the positive force of the uh, American democracy. So similarly, in 2016, of course, uh, just as uh, the Americans are frustrated, most of the world, of course, uh, is no longer laughing. I mean, I think now, just like the Americans, we've got to take this election seriously. Because I think what we hear, while it's expressed in forms that are that are provocative, but I think they also capture some basic ideas, which, which are really being uh, central to the, uh, to the United States, which is uh, uh, that after the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, what should be the US role uh, in externally? How much should the US spend its blood and treasure in the, in the uh, international, uh, to maintain the order in the international system? Some like Bernie Sanders, I mean, are criticizing from the, from the left. Others like Trump, 
uh, from the right uh, are beginning to question many of the foreign policy assumptions that have long dominated, certainly since 89, uh, the, the broad consensus within the US that the US uh, has a burden, has an obligation to shape the international system. That is being questioned. I mean, I think that's a reality. I mean, it's, uh, whether we agree with the terms in which it is being framed, uh, quite clearly uh, that question is being asked. Uh, similarly, on the economic side, uh, if you listen to either Bernie Sanders or Trump, uh, uh, even Clinton, I believe, will change oppositions. I mean, like all good politicians, you have to respond to the popular needs. The question of free trade, that you might have this fascinating situation where the president of a, uh, the, the, the nominee of a, a historically pro-free trade party is going to attack the Democrats, supposedly representing the working class, for uh, supporting free trade. I think this is an extraordinary situation, but it tells you something about what's happening in the United States and that whether the U.S. has benefited from the, the logic of globalization. Because you remember 25 years ago, the idea of a Washington consensus that uh, everyone must do what the U.S. has done, open up your markets, uh, do more trade, uh, liberalize. But Asia, I believe, was a good student, a bit of a too much of a good student. And now the costs of that Asia's catching up uh, is beginning to have an effect uh, within the U.S., and therefore uh, this problem uh, will need to be uh, resolved. So whichever way we look at this debate, I, mean, I think one thing is quite clear. There is a reasonable prospect for significant change in the U.S. policy. Uh, that, that the present order where the U.S. is going to merely accept the kind of system where it is continuously loses jobs or where it has to continuously pay for the security of the others, that model uh, is going to be difficult to sustain. And I think uh, that is something most of us see from outside. And it is something that we have to adapt uh, for the change that is likely to uh, happen in the United States. So that brings me to the, the, the second part, which is uh, that how this debate in the US relates to the, the structural change uh, that is taking place uh, in, uh, in, in, in Asia. I think for the last, uh, certainly last decade or more, uh, there's been much triumphalism from where I come from. Asia is rising. What is it? Good old Mao Zedong who said, the east wind will prevail over the west wind. Uh, there's talk about end of the Vasco da Gama moment. Uh, the, you know, the domination of the west over the east is over. And now you have this grand rise of the east uh, uh, that is going to shape the future uh, of the international system. And then there's much concern, of course, in the West that look, what does this all this mean? And is this really a moment where the Western civilization uh, is in decline and that you're going to have this crazy, uh, you know, uh, what you've uh, been used to for the last 400, 500 years, is that going to disappear in front of our eyes? Uh, that, that, that big question is being posed. But I think much of this debate, like all uh, bumper sticker headlines, uh, it's, a lot of it is premature. And I think it's important to remember that Asia is not a coherent place. Now, for all the talk about the rise of Asia, we don't even agree on where Asia begins and where Asia ends. Uh, so uh, that is a huge uh, problem. Uh, and we also have, I think, we've seen, uh, despite economic growth of the last uh, two and a half decades, we've seen actually the rise of territorial disputes. Uh, we've seen China and Japan, which are so deeply connected, are fighting over I don't know if they're islands, because the law of the sea does not define them as islands, they're just merely rocks. Uh, that here are these two deeply interconnected economies uh, today are willing to fight on history, uh, fight on small islands, tells you uh, that all is not well in, in Asia as well. And then the, you have the other issues. While Asia has grown, it still has problems within. China has problems, India has problems, and there's no country in Asia that does not have internal problems. While growth has created new capabilities, the political rearrangement, the, democrat the complete democratization, or creating internal harmony uh, is a big issue, and I think resolving that uh, is going to be uh, quite, a, quite a challenge. If this is a volatile mix, quite clearly many in Asia believe the U.S. has a role. Uh, contrary to the assumption, even, for example, take the case of Philippines, uh, which in 1992 told the Americans, uh, go home, Yankee, we don't need you, that you had your basis here for 100 years, now time to go home. But now you have the same, the Filipinos actually begging the Americans, come back, Yankee, that we need, we need you here because the Chinese are you know, nibbling away at my territory, so I need you. So the idea that you, know, that it is, you can frame this in East versus West terms, 
or this is about America versus Asia, that actually America is going to be very much part of Asia, whether you want it or not, many in Asia would want the Americans to stay and to provide security. So, so therefore, there is a significant a demand within Asia. Uh, Vietnam, for example, with which uh, the US had a you know, long relationship, not, not a happy one in the past. But today, Vietnam, one of the few communist countries remaining in the world, today eagerly looking for stronger relationship uh, with, the, with, the, with the United States, a military relationship, because they feel the Chinese power breathing down their neck. So, so therefore, what you have is then uh, that the question is not, therefore, the American withdrawal from Asia, the question is one of how does the US relate to Asia? What form and what kind? How much and how, how less? That is the issue and not whether the US is going to be in or out. Uh, because this is going to be a, a more complex uh, situation where the, the internal dynamic within Asia is going to demand some significant role from the US to ensure a, a regional balance of power. And then, of course, that intersects with the US domestic debate on what it wants to do. Now, if you're taking these two things together, uh, you can look at, that brings me to my third part, at least you can look at five, six or more uh, scenarios. One scenario is that, look, the status quo will continue in some form. That is, the US will come back, its economy will pick up, the Chinese will stumble, therefore, nothing will change. The US treaty system is going to remain the way it is, and the US will remain the principal provider of security in Asia. But then, as we said, uh, that's a dream-on scenario, but it's, in, it's not so clear whether this will actually uh, work. A second uh, possibility is that the US simply withdraws. That is, says, look, uh, the time has come for the Chinese uh, leadership in Asia. China is the natural center of Asia. Therefore, a, a Sinocentric Asia is the natural outcome. Let's accept that. But my sense is these two are the, the extreme scenarios. Both are not going to work. So there is going to be the, uh, a range of other possibilities based on some kind of a, an accommodation between the Americans and the Chinese. Uh, you could talk about uh, spheres of influence. That is, look, America will run the show till Hawaii, and the Chinese will take over from there. I mean, that's one Chinese admiral had proposed this. Uh, of course, no one is biting into this, but this is one way of thinking about potential deals between the Americans and the Chinese. You could also think of a situation where uh, US and China jointly do things in Asia. That's our nightmare scenario. That your idea of that look, a G2 or a, or a condominium between the Americans and the Chinese, which is what when the Chinese today talk about a new model great power relationship, what they're saying is, look, we are big boys, let's, let's manage this together. So you stay out of my hair, my internal politics. Uh, you don't push around. You withdraw your military. That's a good, reasonable deal that we could we could we could work with. There are other scenarios where, for example, the U.S. would try and construct a regional balance, not necessarily itself controlling it, but like Britain in Europe of the 19th century can actually contribute to stronger uh, Asian powers that can provide an internal. A balance uh, within Asia, lesser role, but equally uh, consequential in the way that the U.S. helps its partners in Asia to construct a, uh, a, a regional balance of power. Which of these scenarios unfolds? Of course, we're not going to be sure, but uh, what I said at the beginning, that something is going to give, that we have to construct, or we, we are going to see a different framework within this region. So where does India come into this? That's my uh, fourth set of issues I wanted to talk about. Uh, I think much like the U.S., uh, the India too today uh, is debating its role in Asia. In some senses, it's an upward adjustment. While the U.S. has to do some downward adjustment, uh, India has to do some upward adjustment. Uh, in fact, 70 years ago when uh, uh, India became independent, the whole focus was on India must lead Asia. But India's internal uh, economic uh, you know, uh, lack of growth and its orientation towards uh, socialist politics largely saw the diminution of India's power, India's influence in Asia. But it's only in the last 20 years that India has now begun to uh, talk about expanding its position in Asia, of reconnecting to Asia, and, and of uh, dealing with this region in a far more active manner. And the idea that, that India today has the resources, has the capabilities to contribute positively to a stable balance of power system in Asia, uh, that has begun to take root. Uh, well, one is that, that internal, that, that reclaiming a historic position in Asia, that's one part that is driving a larger uh, Indian role. 
A second uh, element that is driving India's role in Asia is the gap that has opened between India and China. That today, uh, you know, till the early 90s, uh, India and China were roughly on equal level in terms of the GDP and the military capabilities. But today you have a Chinese GDP is four, five, five times larger than that of India. Its military spending is four times larger than that of India. So therefore, there is a, a gap that has begun to open up and that as a consequence of that, the Chinese influence, the Chinese economic influence, Chinese military effects on India's neighborhood today have become so strong that dealing with this is, has become the single most important strategic challenge for India. Whether it is about dealing with the Chinese sub nuclear submarines showing up in Sri Lanka, or Chinese uh, building a new port in Sri Lanka, or the Chinese uh, building a new pipeline across Burma in just two years flat, that you're seeing the effects of China as the second largest economy, what it does to India and its environment. Now, we, we don't have to get into this of Chinese are good or bad. That's not the point. The point is, there is a power differential today which generates friction and which generates serious complexities for India's own position in the region. And dealing with that uh, is, has become uh, a big challenge for the, for the Indians. And within that, uh, there are at least two, three uh, issues that India will need to do. I mean, one is about uh, how does it build on its expanding economic strength and how does it build an effective military strength and how does it create greater influence uh, within the subcontinent and Asia. Second important thing, task for India would be uh, how does it resolve its long-standing conflicts with some of its neighbors? Therefore, you see our know, Prime Minister talk about neighborhood first, that if India does not do enough to resolve its own conflicts, its ability to play a larger role in the world uh, will be diminished. So therefore, uh, reintegrating the subcontinent, we're not talking about uh, eliminating borders, but here is a subcontinent that historically, culturally, a, 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 a common space, can we reconstitute that common space of resolving differences within the existing states? And that is a big challenge. But the most important one uh, for India is really the question of what is the, does it do, what kind of relationship will it build with the United States? Because if the power gap is a serious one, the only way to bridge that power gap is by building a deeper relationship with the United States. But this idea that, that we need to build a stronger relationship with the US runs into the whole historic Indian uh, orientation towards uh, non-alignment uh, of neutralism or of uh, a policy that seeks to stay out of the great power uh, politics. And I think it is this impulse that the tension, much of the foreign policy debate uh, within India today is largely about, look, how far do I go with the United States? Uh, do, we, do I become an ally or a partner for the United States? Uh, but what does that mean? I mean, am I like Britain to the United States, a very special relationship? I don't know if it still is one, but little England is going to be, uh, you know, uh, is withdrawing itself. And then the whole question of the allies, the kind of relationship that Japan has had with the United States. But I think here we've got to understand that India is going to be very different. It's not going to do the kind of alliance that the defeated countries of Asia or defeated countries of Europe were willing to do with the Americans at the, at the middle of the 20th century. Uh, because India is a large country, uh, much in a sense following what Washington, George Washington talked about, uh, that no entangling alliances. In fact, many people think it was Washington who was the founder of non-alignment. Uh, of actually saying, as an emerging power, as a rising power, that Washington must not constrain its options by, by aligning or joining with other powers of the old world uh, in, in, in Europe. So the question of, uh, is, if it's not going to be an alliance, can it be something different? So there, I think, the real uh, issue is, it's not about what we call it, whether we call it alignment or non-alignment. The question is, what is it that India and the US can do together? to structure a stable balance of power in Asia. And I think that is the big issue. On that, I see in the last 15 years, I mean, I think certainly starting with the Bush administration and now this eight years of the Obama administration, we've seen significant advance uh, in the India-US political relationship, whether it's on defense, whether it's on counterterrorism, whether it's in the maritime domain, that today India and the US are doing a lot more things together uh, than we've ever done before. I mean, just one example, I see the Boeing is here, uh, that India never bought a single platform 
uh, weapons platform from the U.S. Uh, between 1947 uh, to 2005, when we bought a first time a ship, and then now uh, we have we have bought uh, the C-130 is not Boeing, but the C-130 is Lockheed, a C-17 is Boeing. Uh, we, I think the, the number of a P-8 uh, is, is also Boeing, that we're beginning to buy weapon systems, which you would have thought 10 years ago, I mean, I think impossible for India to do any business with the, the American military companies, but today uh, the U.S. has become one of the largest suppliers of defense equipment to, to India. But that's just the beginning, and I think what we're talking today is ways in which our military capabilities can be can be brought in a greater coordination, uh, if not alignment, uh, in producing that balance. Because the U.S. is going to cut down some of its defense expenditure. The U.S. is not going to do the 7,000, uh, sorry, $700 billion defense expenditure of the kind that it does today. And that the U.S. is, if the U.S. is looking to some kind of a burden sharing, uh, that others pick up the slack. So it's not just Trump who's saying, look, Japanese, if you don't do it, I'm out of here. No, that's one way of saying it. But President Obama is saying the same thing, that, that look, the allies must pick up more slack. That, that, that what the Americans are telling us, what we see, the lesson is, look, guys, you don't have the luxury of demanding that we do everything and then criticize us, whatever happens, whatever we do. I mean, that situation where the US would be the first responder in any crisis and would also take most of the blame for anything that goes wrong, that phase, I think, is, is, over, is behind us. So therefore, I think the challenge for countries like India is it's not enough to criticize the United States. The question is, what does India do? At that, I think, today there is a greater recognition in India that India must see itself as a, as a responsible power that must take, play a larger role uh, in the region, take greater security responsibilities. And I think how we do that uh, is, the, is the story of India, whether uh, you know, we agree with the U.S. on everything or not. The question then is, uh, how much do we do, how we do it, but there's only one way to go for India, which is to go up and do more things, take more responsibilities, both within the region and beyond, uh, to, to build that relationship. And what we've seen happen in India, uh, at least in the last uh, 15 years, I mean, at least cutting across different governments, whether it is Manmohan Singh or Modi, whether it is Vajpayee or, or Narsimha Rao, we've seen uh, the general movement towards that greater collaboration and partnership. That doesn't mean we are still in a very happy relationship here, but as somebody said uh, about uh, U.S. relationships with uh, China and India, uh, U.S. has an unhappy marriage with China, uh, but the, it doesn't know how to get a divorce, I mean, which is the locked in heavy interdependence, uh, what is $500 million trade, uh, you are in each other's, you know, at each other's throat, but at, at the same time, you're also deeply interconnected. So it's an unhappy marriage. There's no divorce uh, out of it. And in the case of India, it is uh, kind of a permanent uh, wooing of a relationship, but actually no consummation of that relationship. So that, that you have actually a lot of uh, love affair, but, but really uh, unrequited at the, at the end. So I think the challenge is going to be that can we actually translate uh, this engagement into something more substantive and something that is less inhibited and, and more positive in the coming years. My own sense is, uh, whatever the limitations of a political class are at this point of time, there is going to be the circumstances are going to compel, I think, uh, India and the U.S. to draw closer. Uh, the question now is not, uh, uh, it's not whether, but the question is when and how we do it, and that is the big challenge, and I think what we see, our Prime Minister is going to be here in a, in a, in a few weeks, uh, in June, first week of June in White House, and I think we've seen this, the fourth visit by the Indian Prime Minister uh, to Washington uh, in, in barely four, in two years. I mean, this is unprecedented, the kind of expansion, that, that uh, of engagement that we're doing today, and I think this lays the basis for uh, something, I think, uh, structural, something more consequential, and one where uh, India and the U.S., together uh, are going to shape the destiny of Asia in the coming years. So I think I'll stop here and uh, we'll be open for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohan, for your remarks. If you have a question, if you could please raise your arm and once I've called on you, we will have a member of our staff bring a microphone. Yes, sir. It's on its way. 
Dr. Mohan, uh, thank you very much for your remarks. Uh, one striking uh, omission was, at least for me, was any reference to Pakistan. Uh, and in this dance between China and the United States uh, and India, uh, what role does Pakistan have, if any? I think uh, Pakistan is a very important country. Uh, it's got 200 million people. It's got nuclear weapons. It's got a fairly impressive army. And it's, above all, it has got location. And I know and a lot of businessmen here, you know, location, location, location. So Pakistan sits on a very, very important uh, location that, that, that links South Asia to the Gulf, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to Central Asia, to, to China, to Russia, uh, all those things. So in some sense, the geopolitical significance of Pakistan will remain. Now, there has been, for 70 years since the partition of the subcontinent, there has been a tension between India and Pakistan. And the nuclear weapons have made it, interest paradoxically, uh, at once less, uh, you know, there have been no major wars between the two countries, but there's been a lot of other stuff that has happened in the subconventional conflict. So there are issues today, but I think what we've seen is, uh, irrespective of what Pakistan does, uh, it's my belief that India must find reconciliation with Pakistan. That is, whatever strategy India does in terms of its expanding its role in the world, that resolving its differences with Pakistan, of undoing the bitter consequences of the, the partition of the subcontinent in 1947, that must be, that is, I believe, a central part of uh, India's contemporary strategy. And that's why you have, whether it's Modi or Manmohan Singh, uh, whether it was Vajpayee before, every single prime minister in the last 25, 30 years has tried to find a way of a way out with Pakistan. You can't say we've been successful, but but that is that is part that's something that no leader in India today can avoid doing it. But that doesn't uh, will it produce immediate results? Uh, no one is willing to bet on it. But the fact is, we have to keep trying to end the tragedy of 1947. That is, we need to find a minimal, uh, at least a minimal ways of coexisting. And I think. That is a central thing, because we, 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 we have to do that. And that is the answer to greater Chinese penetration into South Asia. Or by merely criticizing the Americans or the Chinese for saying, look, are you helping Pakistan or Pakistan army? That's not going to solve our problems. So we, we got to look beyond all that, because there's so much that binds us as well. I mean, if you see the Indians and the Pakistanis outside, in, I mean, outside the subcontinent, it's hardly, you know, they get along quite well. They so much listen to the same music, or this, they see the same bad movies. I mean, that you can talk about it, but, but that's a different story. So, so there is a lot out there uh, which we are not built enough on. And, and I think that is the uh, problem. And, and not to merely see it as an interstate dispute. India and Pakistan are not France and Germany. They're not the two Koreas. They are somewhat very different, and I think uh, it is that what binds us uh, is, is what we need to build on. Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, I'm hoping that I didn't miss this in your speech. Can you talk more about the challenges of expanding the middle class in India and so, China? Expanding? Expanding the middle class in India and China. Look, I, there is, I mean, See, in the case of China, I mean, I think the, the, here is the, the core argument about the middle class. I mean, that will the rise of a middle class, the rise of new prosperity in China, can the Chinese political system actually stay the same? That is, can, because what the Chinese Communist Party has shown us, look, a Chinese Communist Party can actually build capitalism. There's red capitalism, as some of us would call it. Uh, but can it also limit the aspirations of a growing middle class? I mean, that is the central problem that whether it is on, you know, on Sina.com or Weibo, or how do you limit, how do you prevent the emergence, uh, the, the consequences of a middle class that seeks more uh, room for itself? And that is the, historically, there's been a conflict, right? The rise of a bourgeoisie, as we said, uh, and against the old order in Europe, which is what produced the, the revolutions. In the case of China, how does it happen? We, we, we really don't know. In the case of India, the middle class is still small at this point. I mean, I think while the growth has taken place, uh, that the question of whether the middle class, which, is, which has historically led the 
uh, the, the, the politicians, the political class, the bureaucracy have come from the middle class. But can they find a way to actually satisfy the aspirations? Not on the political side, there's probably there's a bit of a too much of democracy, but the question is, can we extend that prosperity? Uh, how do we do that? That is our big, a big challenge for India. So I think the problems of India and China in that sense of how do you deal with the middle class are fundamentally different. And, and I think we'll have to find, each one of us will have to find uh, our own answers for that. Yes, sir. Yeah, the microphone's on its way. Do you feel that, do you feel that the uh, one belt, one road that China's developing through Pakistan uh, might help to bridge some of the economic development between India, Pakistan, China, and basically the entire southeastern region? Yeah. And I think the One Belt, One Road, I think it's, a, it's almost as a sweeping historic initiative uh, uh, what President Xi Jinping has outlined two years ago. But if you look back over the last 10 years, actually it started quite, quite before. I mean, uh, right under Jiang Zemin, when he talked about the Go West strategy, that is, uh, you remember Deng Xiaoping had said, let some people get rich first, which he meant the coastal China is going to develop first, and after that, we're going to develop the interior regions. So by the turn, by the late 90s, the Chinese leadership was saying that, look, our coastal regions have developed, now we must extend prosperity in, and one way of doing it was actually to build the railroads, oil pipelines, connectivity, all across China. And that's the period when we saw a railway line come across the frozen Tibetan plateau uh, closer to India. We saw the extension of the railway lines to South, you know, South Xinjiang Railway. We've seen them push closer to the Burmese border. That they said, look, that you got to expand beyond the eastern seaboard. And one way to do that was to actually build railways and road links. So it's only, so then the, it was the logical thing after that to expand beyond the borders. So therefore, if you look at Western China, uh, that it is, that it is landlocked, right? I mean, if you look at Yunnan uh, in southwestern China, you'd look at Tibet, you look at uh, Xinjiang, you look at the other parts, they're all landlocked, so therefore you need to connect them to the neighboring regions. So therefore the Chinese are doing is today to connect the inter interior parts of China to the, to the neighboring regions. And of course skeptics would say, look, they've got so much money, they've got excess industrial capacity, therefore uh, the easiest way, I mean, build highways as they did in the US, just build roads, railways across the Chinese, and then they have the high-speed uh, railway technology that you can actually push it all around and connect the region. But whatever their intentions are, whatever the, the impulse, impulses are, that actually it is connecting vast amounts of space in inner Asia. So therefore this is going to have consequence for everyone and I think the challenge for India has been uh, somewhat uh, problematic because we, we, don't, you know, we don't fully support it, we can't say no to it because in the case of China-Pakistan economic corridor, where actually it runs through Kashmir, which is a disputed territory. Therefore, Delhi is saying that, look, uh, we can't support you because you're doing this through a disputed territory. But the sections of Indians are also arguing that, look, uh, where there is no sovereignty disputes, for example, the Chinese have a proposal for a China, Burma, Bangladesh, India corridor that you can actually develop. We are talking to the Chinese on that, whether that will work. But my sense is uh, that given India's uh, China territorial dispute, that the prospect of doing more things in the, in the Chinese case, in the, in the Pakistan case have been done. But at some point, uh, we have to talk to the Chinese. That look, that actually the market is in India. You can connect it to Pakistan, go through Pakistan to the Arabian Sea, but the markets are in India. And the Chinese know that. So the question is, look, can we freeze the territorial dispute and say, look, uh, can we do more things together? Or for example, the two Punjabs, let's say Punjab in Pakistan, the richest part of Pakistan, and Indian Punjab, can they look, can we cut across the, the divide that has come through partition? Can we do more things? So I think there are distinct possibilities if we can find a way to dampen the, uh, the, the territorial disputes. Yes, sir. And, sir, a microphone's on its way. My name is Jatendra Bedi. My question is related to the recent uh, developments in Nepal, especially with regards to India-Nepal relations. If you see right from the day elections have taken place, right till day before yesterday, uh, the disturbing developments that have taken place, especially with regards to uh, Indian uh, government, do you think it is mishandling on part of India 
or is it that India is losing Nepal to someone? And also my question is, how important is not to lose Nepal for India? Look, I, I think, uh, I don't know how many uh, people here, I mean, I think Nepal is one of the most beautiful countries of the world. I mean, I think uh, you must, for those of you not visited, I think it's one of the most, I think, almost a divine, a divine place in many ways, uh, nestling on the Himalayas uh, between uh, India and, and China. So here is a country that has just two neighbors. One is China, one is India, the two fastest growing economies. And they, it is the poorest country in the world. I mean, that, that part of the tragedy in, in Nepal has been that the Nepali political class unwilling to do what is right, which is, look, you don't have to be pro-China or pro-India. All you need is to take advantage of these two giant neighbors that you have, build roads across, do trade, do tourism, and Nepal would be one of the most prosperous countries in the world. But a political class uh, in Nepal that's unwilling to do serious reform within and wants to play India and China against each other uh, is never going to make progress. So I'm, I'm not worried about, uh, you know, have we lost China? I mean, like the Americans used to have these great debates. I mean, who lost what? Who lost China or who lost something else? It's not ours to lose in that sense. I mean, that, that, that look, there is a historic natural affinity between India and Nepal. There have been mistakes have been made by both sides in terms of where this relationship is today. And the Chinese are naturally looking to expand their influence. So I think the challenge for India is this, that look, geography, history, and culture bind Nepal much closer to India. And half the problem for the Chinese is, look, the Tibetans, which is actually when we say Nepal-China border, it's actually Nepal-Tibet border. So the Chinese are worried about potential anti-Tibet anti-China activities in Tibet taking place in Nepal. Therefore, they have a security concern. But my, my concern is that, look, we've not taken full advantage of what we could do with Nepal, of building a more durable, sustainable relationship. And because, look, don't, don't forget the Nepalese still fight for the Indian Army, right? I mean, as our Prime Minister said, Nepalese have fought for India in its wars with Pakistan and China and have died. So therefore, I think I wouldn't treat it as, a, as an object that we have to deal with, but it is actually a deep relationship and that we need to build it and need a different approach to reinvigorate that relationship. Yes, sir. In, uh, in the back, please. Hi, Dr. Mohan. Um, so I understand that U.S. and Indian ties, that that would be beneficial to be growing that and that China is going to continue to be aggressive. But do you think that if... U.S. Indian ties are pursued too aggressively, that that may be viewed by China as uh, deliberately trying to constrain them, and that that may possibly exacerbate geopolitical tensions more than they already are between the U.S. and China? Look, I think uh, there is this uh, paranoid uh, problem, you know, that look, uh, it doesn't mean the paranoid has no enemies, but uh, you could see uh, Actually, everything you know, everyone does around them is a problem. Right? So Chinese are going to object to anything you do with the Americans. But my question is this to my Chinese friends. I tell them always, look, you have a deeper, longer relationship with the Americans than we've had. As I said, your trade, US-China trade is $500 billion. The American companies are the ones which are deeply connected to, uh, to, to the U to, to China market than that, that to India. U.S.-India trade is 100 billion, China-U.S. trade is 500 billion. I mean, that's where we are. The scale and the intensity of the U.S.-China relationship, I mean, you can trace it back to the American missionaries who went there. Uh, Americans didn't know much about India, but, but they, they were deeply connected to, to China, pre-revolutionary China. So therefore, that, there is a, a stronger bind out there. And second, when the Chinese got closer to the Americans in 71, under Nixon and Kissinger and, and, and Mao Zedong, but they didn't ask how India felt about it, right? So you, you, you're not going to do, you know, that uh, if you're the number two power and if you're so sensitive that nobody else should have a relationship. Because when U.S. and India, sorry, when U.S. and China got together, that's when India got closer to the Russians. So therefore, people are going to jockey for power, do various things, but my sense is that I don't think we have a veto over what China does with America. Right. I mean, that our problem is we don't do enough economic engagement with the, with the, with the Americans. Similarly, uh, the Chinese uh, can't have a veto over what India does with the U.S. But we have to live with, with that each of us are going to pursue our interests with the U.S. 
Therefore, the question is, uh, how do you keep that going in, in, a, in a balanced form so that we don't threaten uh, each other in a, in, a, in a fundamental way? That is a problem. There is a, that issue. Uh, the Chinese will always frame it. But look at the Chinese. I mean, they lived with American troops in Japan, 60, 70 years. South Korea, 70 years. Philippines, almost, what, 60 years, and now Americans are going back in. Taiwan. So India is, is last of their concerns. I mean, that look, they're living, they lived with American forward military presence. If you look at the map, here is the Chinese East Coast, and along that, an American screen of American forward military presence. They've enough to deal with on the other side. I mean, it's not as if we're going to let the American troops strung along the Himalayas. So, you know, the Americans want to do it, neither we will do it. So therefore, I don't think the, the, ex the exaggeration of potential threat from India-China relationship, India-US relationship, is, is it can't be taken too seriously. Sir, in June, the Council will be hosting our Chicago Forum on Global Cities. I'm interested in your thoughts on what global cities in India are doing to influence Indian foreign policy. No, I mean, cities, I mean, I, I'm not, I don't do much on the urban development, but uh, since I live in one, I mean, you know that, look, uh, uh, cities are going to be quite central to, I mean, how they relate to the world. I mean, that, while well, you have a large uh, countries like India, China, the U.S., uh, it's really the big cities in those countries that matter, I mean, how they relate to the world, the elites live there, the business uh, groups are there, so, so you, you have actually uh, how the cities, in, in many ways, historically, dominated uh, the, the way the countries uh, behave. And in the case of the Chinese, for example, I mean, the Chinese have uh, created this extraordinary uh, framework in which the five cities have got statehood of a kind. They were the full economic powers. I uh, hope Indians do something similar, that, that we've actually neglected our cities. So we need to do a lot more on our, on our cities. And, and the question then becomes, uh, at least for the present prime minister, has talked about smart cities, of using modern technology to uh, to, to build at least 100 smart cities. So I think we're going to do a lot of investment because in India, the demographic has shifted towards urbanization. The more people living in the cities now. And I think the percentage can only keep uh, growing up. So then for, therefore, we've not done enough uh, in terms of the interaction between cities in the Indian case. Where our cities are not like uh, Chicago or New York where the local mayors have such power. In India, the power is still with the province. Uh, therefore, the problem, therefore, is uh, can we actually empower our cities? There, I think, in India is behind that we've got to do more to make our cities uh, empowered and be able to engage the rest of the world in a, in a more vigorous way. I think there's someone there. Yes, sir. In the front, please. And a microphone's on its way. I'm curious of how you would see, how would um, a closer relationship between the United States and India be manifested? Would, I mean, what would it really look like? You said you don't picture American troops in the Himalayas, but would it be mostly an eco better and more intense economic relationship, or would it also have a security element to it? No, I think it will have to have, uh, have, to have both where our economic relationship is uh, utterly underdeveloped. Therefore, uh, what we're talking about, moving the trade from 100 billion to 500 billion in the next, I don't know, they don't tell the number of years, so it's a nice figure that you throw, but essentially an aspirational one uh, at this point. But they, uh, that India needs to do a lot more reforms. And a lot of cases where actually the integration between Indian and the US economies has taken place in spite of the governments, uh, between Bangalore and, and the Silicon Valley, or that the, the integration of the IT sectors, that, that level of integration has, has begun to happen, which never existed before. So my sense is, uh, if you look at the future in terms of the new technologies, et cetera, in the high technology sectors, there's a lot more that India and the US uh, must do and can do, and hopefully that will unfold if our own reforms uh, keep gathering pace. On the security side, look, I think there is a lot that you can do between doing nothing and, and having American troops. A lot that India can do itself, like for example, if India takes care of some of the burdens that the US has today in the Indian Ocean. So in the sense that you're relieving the Americans to do other things in the in, in, in Pacific. That's one way of dividing our responsibility. Second way we're, we're looking at it is that, look, can India join the coalition of the Americans and the Japanese and the Australians uh, in the Pacific and say, look, can we do more things with them? 
So we're beginning to do joint exercises with, with each, you know, with, with uh, India, US and Japan do it. Uh, we have a framework for India, Australia, Japan cooperation. So India does more in Asia so that, that the, the US capacity to sustain the present order is reinforced by India's security contributions. A third way I think is, do, is doing it is, is that look, India and the US work together to help the smaller countries to build their capabilities. For example, a lot of small countries today look for maritime capabilities to police their EEZ. Can we do more things there? Then we have, say, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. Again, the two navies are beginning to talk about it. Can we work together to, to actually uh, intervene in the kind of situations where a tsunami takes place, can we do things together? But there's some things are not going to happen. I don't see them happening. For example, India is not going to support, say, tomorrow US intervention, say, in, in uh, Iraq or somewhere else. I mean, you, so if you want to use Indian facilities and say, look, we're going to do this. India says, look, uh, do we have a dog in that fight, as the Americans say? So that, that calculation uh, will always be there. For example, your friends, I mean, like, what did Germany and France do in 2003? They said, look, US is wrong. Of course, then they go and do the same mistake in Libya. That's a different story. Uh, but the, the fact is, Turkey was, is a NATO ally, but doesn't let the, uh, the Americans use Turkey to do Iraq invasion. So that level of calculation will remain. But there's one hell of a lot that we can do together on this range of issues from you know, humanitarian operations to uh, doing a more helping each other in securing Asia and the Indo-Pacific, uh, that is certainly uh, possible. And I think we just at the beginning of that, there's a lot more that, that we need to do. And I think the, the, the declaration that President Obama and Prime Minister Modi issued uh, last January talks about the two sides working together to do more things in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. We've seen some of that develop, for example, in the political positions on the South China Sea and other things following that. I think there's a gentleman oh, raise. Okay. Yes, sir. You mentioned the cities and the provinces. He did. I mean, I'm, I was strange. <laughs> I think you mentioned provinces, yep. but fair enough. Yep. Uh, a couple of months ago, we had a presentation here at the council by George Friedman, hmm. and he approached a lot of questions from the security perspective, and he was asked about India. And he said the question for India is whether it wants to be one country or 40 smaller British empires? What would be your reaction to his question? Look, I think uh, George, I mean, I, mean I, I don't know him personally, but uh, everyone reads his geopolitical stuff. I mean, I think great, great mind. I think great way, he, in fact, he connects the dots. Look, I, I think, you know, the countries like India, US, China, today, or Russia for that matter, are gigantic entities. I mean, I think there's, there's no, going back and say, look, let's undo what you've done. So therefore, like, like, many Indians still find it hard. You know, the, the governor of Illinois uh, comes to Delhi and says, look, I'm ready to do business. For Indian foreign office, it's kind of, what the hell is going on? Why are this provincial you know, guy is coming and <laughs> doing business uh, uh, outside? But Indians are learning now. So Indian chief ministers now go abroad. And they say, look, we've got to do it. And Prime Minister Modi himself has talked about devolving some of the things to the, uh, to the, to the regions that the, the provinces must have a bigger role in foreign policy or uh, Consul General is here. I mean, I think he was just telling me the other day uh, how uh, it, it is so much interest uh, in, the, uh, in the Indian states to, to engage. Uh, Hyderabad, for example, I mean, where I come from, I mean, I'm in the same state as the Consul General. Uh, there is actually, since the US is now a, 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 what do you call it, a consulate, uh, probably issues large number of visas. And uh, I was told that there's a little temple next to the consulate which says, look, if you want a visa, you pray there first. I mean, <laughs> so uh, the level of, uh, uh, you know, so if you go to Hyderabad, you go to uh, Chennai in South India, I mean, there is more flights going to Singapore than to Delhi. But that is, I think there is something, I mean, large countries, I think, again, a Chinese proverb, you know, you, you can't, you know, fry them too hard. If, if, you know, small fish, large countries, you know, if you try to do too much on them, then there's problems. So I think the centralization of the kind that Russia did, the centralization of the kind India did uh, in, the 50, in the 60s and the 70s was actually detrimental to India. But today I think it is possible to imagine in India that's more 
loosely organized that, that you devolve. That's what a federalism, in India, we don't, our constitution doesn't use the word federalism, but the fact that you have, you, can, you have to devolve eventually because the size of each province is so large. So I think it's in our interest to, to devolve that power. And again, I think some question was asked on Nepal, that if we use our neighboring chief, uh, our chief ministers of provinces to deal with the neighbors, uh, you get a lot of uh, effects. I mean, you can get a lot of positive things. The Punjab chief ministers on both sides, they can do better business than Delhi and Islamabad sitting and negotiating. So there are possibilities, but, but in, in a design, in a design. I think the, that's why I think uh, we have a lot of lessons to see how American federalism is organized and how the, the, the distribution of powers was done, a fairly strong centralized state, but then a lot of devolution that I think there is something for India to learn that look, it, it, there's not the tight, you know, like we had the Soviet Union, which said everybody had a right to secede. I mean, if you read the Soviet constitution, uh, of course, eventually that happened, not because it was, uh, it was uh, properly organized, but it was too tightly controlled. So I think we need to find that balance. My sense is we are moving in the right direction to give more uh, devolution to the states. We have time for one final question. Yes, sir, on the side, please. Hello. Uh, we are, uh, you know, America and India, they've been uh, talking about a good relationship for a long time. All this talk happened on the political level and uh, in media and everywhere, but uh, internally, when the technology transfer comes, uh, it never happened. Uh, some of the warfield technology and stuff been old and, uh, you know, India is asking for a long time. A lot, lot of treaties and agreement been signed, but uh, still it's not there. In other side, where somebody who really don't need it, uh, Pakistan, for them, it's, a, it's a completely available for them. It's completely available. Uh, none of the defense company, they have to ask for any ITAR, ITAR restriction or anything. It is available for them. It shows on their ITAR website. Uh, some stuff is totally available there. Who, are, who, might, who might be can use against America too. Uh, what, what, what is the reason, what do you think, what is the reason for uh, this kind of uh, irregulatory relationship, uh, the, the, the army relationship between two countries? Look, I think uh, liberalizing the technology trade uh, has been a central element of the new relationship. And I think things have improved vastly compared to where we work uh, as recently as 1998, when India did nuclear tests, came under the US sanctions. And since then, I think there's been a significant uh, liberalization of the technology transfers. And I think what we've seen happen in the last three, four years, uh, is Secretary Carter trying to devise a new framework, especially on the defense side, uh, what do we do to ease the flow of technologies from the US? So I think uh, barring a small ban today, uh, India is a fairly, you know, is eligible for, for, a, for, a, for quite a range of technologies that, that the US has. And we're hoping to see when the prime minister comes here, There'll be some agreements where we're going to see further liberalization that is take place. But I don't think there's a comparison between India and Pakistan at this stage, actually. Uh, Pakistan has, uh, has a whole range of other problems, but I don't think it's fair to compare uh, India, India to Pakistan on this stage, because I think there's been a very significant, very substantive effort uh, in the last 15 years to change that uh, earlier. Because if you go back to history, uh, much of India's strategic programs, the nuclear program, the space program, were built by American cooperation. Ford Aerospace, I mean, the company doesn't exist anymore, but they're the ones who did initial Indian satellites. Uh, India's first reactor was built by the Americans, the GE uh, in Tarapur. So there was a huge amount of cooperation in the 50s and the 60s, but 70s, the political drift apart, India's then the nuclear differences from 74, largely pushed us apart and, you know, serious crisis that had emerged because of that. And I think the story of the last 15 years has been to reverse that. So I, I think we made enough, a lot of progress, but hopefully there'll be more uh, in the coming weeks and months. Please join me in thanking Dr. C. Raj Mohan, our inaugural Marshall.